Leonis found a suitable opportunity to say to Dionysus, Sir, you haven't been on your estate by the sea for a long time now. You're needed there. You have the herds and crops to inspect, and it will soon be harvest time. And we built luxurious buildings as you told us to. You ought to enjoy them. Besides, you'll find your grief easier to bear in the country. You'll be distracted by having your estate to enjoy and run. And if you're pleased with some herdsman or shepherd, you can give him the woman I've just bought. Dionysus liked the suggestion and set a date for going. The order was passed along the line. Coachmen got their coaches ready. Grooms prepared their horses. Boatmen their boats. Dionysus' friends were invited to join him on the journey, and so were a large number of freedmen. He was given to lavishness. When everything was ready, he gave instructions for the baggage and most of the people to go by sea and the vehicles to follow when he had gone ahead, because it was not proper for a man who was in mourning to have an elaborate escort. He mounted his horse at the crack of dawn before most people realized he was leaving. He had four men with him, including Leonis. Dionysus, then, was on his way to the country. That night, Calerho had dreamed about Aphrodite and decided to pay homage to her again. She was standing there praying when Dionysus dismounted and entered the shrine ahead of his companions. Calerho heard footsteps and turned to face him. So Dionysus saw her. Aphrodite, he cried, be gracious to me. May your appearance be propitious to me. He was in the act of prostrating himself when Leonidas caught him up and said, Sir, this is the woman I bought. Don't be alarmed. Woman, come to your master. Well, when Calerho heard the word master, she bowed her head and let loose a flood of tears. She was slow to forget her liberty. Dionysus struck Leonis. Impious man, he cried, do you speak to gods as if they were humans? Are you calling her a bought slave? No wonder you couldn't find the man who offered her for sale. Have you not heard what Homer tells us? And the gods, taking the shape of strangers from other lands, observed the insolence and the orderly behavior of mankind. At that, Calerho replied, Stop making fun of me. Stop calling me a goddess. I am not even a happy mortal. As she spoke, her voice seemed the voice of a god to Dionysius. It had a musical sound with the effect of a liar's note. He did not know what to do. He was too embarrassed to continue talking to her, so he went off to his house, already aflame with love. Soon the baggage arrived from town, and the rumor of the incident spread quickly, so they were all eager to see the woman, though they all pretended to be worshipping Aphrodite. Calerho was embarrassed by the crowd of people and did not know what to do. Everything was strange to her. She could not even see the familiar Plangon, who was busy receiving her master. The hour grew late, and no one came to the house. They were all standing at the shrine as if bewitched. Leonis realized what had happened, and he went to the sanctuary and brought Calerho out. Then you could see that royalty is born in people as it is in a queen bee, because everybody followed Calerho spontaneously, as though she had been elected queen for her beauty. Calerho went off to her regular quarters. As for Dionysus, he was wounded, but he tried to cover up the wound, like the well-brought-up brought up man he was, who prided himself on behaving properly. Not wanting his servants to look down on him, or his friends to think him immature, he struck it out the whole, stuck it out the whole evening. He thought no one would notice, but in fact his silence made him all the more conspicuous. He took a portion of the meal and said, Take this to the forum woman. Don't say it's from her master. Say it's from Dionysius. He prolonged the drinking after dinner as long as he could. He knew he would not be able to sleep, so he wanted his friend's company in his sleeplessness. The night was far advanced when he dismissed the company. He was too preoccupied to sleep. In thought, he was in Aphrodite's shrine, recalling every detail, her face, her hair, 
the way she turned, the way she looked at him, her voice, her appearance, her words, her very tears inflamed him. There was a visible conflict in him now between reason and passion. Desire was flooding over him, but his noble soul tried to bear up against it. As if rising above the waves, he said to himself, Dionysius, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. The most virtuous, the most distinguished men in Ionia, the admiration of satraps, kings, whole populations, and you behave like an adolescent. You fall in love at first sight, and while you're in mourning at that, before you've even paid proper respect to your poor wife's departed spirit. Is that what you've come into the country for? To marry in your mourning clothes? And to marry a slave? She may not even belong to you. You haven't even got the registration deed for her. This was good sense, but Eros, who took his restraint as an insult, set himself against Dionysus and fanned to greater heat the blaze in a heart that was trying to be rational about love. Unable to stand this solitary discussion any longer, Dionysus sent for Leonis. Leonis knew why he had been summoned, but pretended not to, and feigned alarm. What's stopping you from sleeping, sir? he asked. It isn't fresh grief come over you at the death of your lady, is it? It is a lady, yes, said Dionysus, but not the one who is dead. I have no secrets from you. You are well disposed and loyal to me. Leonis, I am finished, I tell you. You are the cause of my troubles. You brought fire into my house, or rather into my own heart, and I am worried by the very mystery that surrounds the woman. You tell me a story about some traitor you know nothing about, who he is, where he came from, where he's gone off to. Would anyone who owned such a beautiful woman sell her in a deserted spot? And would he sell her for a talent? She's worth a king's fortune. Did some god mislead you? Think, now, try to recall what happened. What men did you see? Whom did you talk to? Tell me the truth. You didn't see the boat. I didn't see it, sir, but I heard about it. There you are, you see. It is a nymph or a nerid who has come up from the sea. Even divine beings are at certain times caught in the grip of destiny and compelled to associate with human beings. Poets and historians tell us that. Dionysus was only too ready to let himself build the woman up to a stature too august for human associations. Leonis wanted to oblige his master. Let's not insist on knowing who she is, sir, he said. I'll bring her to you, if you like. Don't distress yourself about not getting what you want. You can satisfy your love. I cannot do that, said Dionysus. First, I must know who the woman is and where she comes from. So let us find out the truth from her tomorrow morning. I won't have her come here. I don't want to be suspected of violent intentions. No, our conversation shall take place where I first saw her, at Aphrodite's shrine.